This conference will now be recorded. I was like, somehow, yeah, like it's reinstalled. Like, it's just wild. Like, it's so this computer to merge a couple of PDFs. <laughs> we just want one PDF. Yeah, because it doesn't make sense. I'm sure you're aware that these email archives do not exist. Yeah, so I what, why would you like jump back though? Especially when you said you only needed one. Why do you think? Is your internet working right now or are you just leaving your time? No, I'm Oh my email came up. But I can't get the lecture stage to work on GitHub. I can't get anything to work on my internet right now. I have a little bit of work for like the last 20 minutes. I don't know why not. Even on. Yeah. GitHub's not working at all, huh? The internet isn't working at all. But earlier, I thought maybe it wasn't working when I was in my office. But when I was in my office, I tried to go to the lecture stage. Okay. And I could open the lab page, the homework page, but I couldn't open the lecture. But now I don't know if the internet thing around. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I it's like a new Wi-Fi where it works on multiple campuses. You have to like register, but it's better than the original Wi-Fi. Can we just log in with our like net IDs to it? Treasure room? Yeah. I don't know. I've not done it yet, but I'm sure it'd be good. Oh, there it is. Yeah. But yeah, you need to like go to their website and make a account or something. Yeah, I'm sure she needs to do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, I, I got it to I got to work here. Um, there's no, I guess not. The lectures page is broken. Huh. Interesting. Last week, maybe. Two weeks ago, <laughs> I think she came in like all frazzled. I was the only one in here. She's like, I messed up again. Like, <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna the Um, yeah, maybe it's still rebuilding or something. Um, huh. Have you put the um, scan on for the one that we skipped up yet? Right. No, I I haven't because I have it on my. Yeah, no, that's a good reminder. I it's on my work computer, and I I think like I haven't been in the office uh, since it started snowing. So, <laughs> so I'll try to do that uh, maybe by this weekend, and then we can. Uh, it's it's not critical because it's not really related to the the lab for today, but um, we will primarily like for the lab today. We're primarily running some of the stand models and Jags models that are already kind of compiled. But um, but yeah, it'd be, it'd be good to get that up there, and I put up. I put up all of the material for today's lecture, which is um, on HMMs, and so that should all be there, uh, or at least the video should. I'm not sure about, um, I'm not sure whether that's going to be building right on the lectures page, though. Let's see here. I think. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I'll just, I'll just talk through this. I think like it probably will be less than an hour, and then uh, we'll talk about. Um, uh, the, the lab, and if people have any questions about uh, class projects, et cetera, um, we can definitely deal with that too. Um, I think that everybody else is probably probably still coming back from La Jolla today, but um, today uh, we wanted to kind of talk about an introduction to um, hidden Markov models or HMMs, and these are these are a pretty new tool and in, in kind of with applications to time series in fisheries and ecology. Um, they've been uh, used quite a bit in other fields, so kind of splitting this, we'll, we'll talk firstly about what these actually are, then move into some basic theory and a little, little bit of notation uh, without getting too into the weeds. Um, and then we have a couple examples to walk through with some univariate and some multivariate uh, examples. Um, there's a lot of really good uh, background reading out there. There's, there's two, book, two books in particular that are by uh, Zucchini et al. And so the first and second editions of these I found to be uh, really useful because they include snippets of our code and um, and basically explain some complicated concepts at a pretty um, 
a pretty easy to understand level. So I think that those have been helpful for me. Um, there's also a couple of packages that we'll talk about. Um, we'll really talk about the latter today, this debt mix package, but there's a number of others, including MSM and um, uh, some other packages that are more tailored toward ecological examples. But um, but there's a number of, of kind of tools out there, so you don't need to necessarily write your own code to implement these, these models. Um, we've already talked a lot in this class about state-based models, um, especially in a univariate setting. And so um, state-based models, remember, just include this process model, which represents kind of the unseen state of nature that we can't directly observe or, or measure. And so we have, we have a model for that, and then we have a, a second model that sits on top of the process model that's the data or observation model. And for the case of most of what we're doing in this class and most of the applications that we deal with in, in the real world, um, we assume that the, the deviations from these models are normally distributed. Um, so the process model, those deviations just represent environmental stochasticity, and with the data model, they represent measurement error or noise associated with kind of the observation process. These equations should be uh, pretty familiar at this point because we've, we've kind of talked about them in a lot of different formats, but the process model in its simplest case is just something like this random walk. Um, and then on top of that, we have this observation model where again, these deviations for the, the observation error and then the process variation are, are normally distributed in some, uh, some variance terms. So, um, so where these models get more complicated is obviously if we include certain, to include, um, like autoregressive terms in here, then we can have um, this, this model start to, be, to behave like a mean reverting process. And so instead of in the last example with the random walk, um, we could have a time series that just kind of trails off um, and doesn't come back to a kind of a common stationary value. But when we start to add coefficients like the AR terms, um, we can get behavior so that things are, are um, kind of fluctuating around certain levels. And so this, in this, you can get behavior that would be similar to the kind of data that we see with HMMs um, by adding these terms, but they're, they're still just not very well designed to model the kinds of data that we might be, be more interested in fitting HMMs to. Um, so HMMs, I think, are, are the hidden markup models are most useful in cases where we're thinking about modeling regimes. And so there's a number of different um, papers out there. Tessa Francis has a good paper. Um, from some data from the Newport line in uh, that NOAA collects. And so this is a long-term um, long term time series. It's a multivariate time series because this is data for multiple different taxonomic groups. But um, she was interested in kind of identifying um, how species patterns change on the Oregon coast based on warm versus cool years. And so this is a kind of a multivariate um, time series model. And in this case, um, she didn't implement an HMM, but it's the kind of data that you certainly could. Uh, because it, it's kind of it's obviously fluctuating between these two different uh, kind of states. Um, there's another another paper um, that's been uh, kind of doing the same thing with with fisheries recruitment, thinking about these cool versus warm years. And so I think for for most of the applications that I've seen in fisheries, uh, people are thinking about uh, model using using HMMs or these types of models to, to really think about classifying regimes into into two types. Um, the exception is probably like uh, there's there's a number of folks, especially those at the Alaska Center um, at Sandpoint, who are developing models or H applying HMM these hidden markup models to um, to like animal telemetry data. And so they have uh, if you go out and, and put tags on a bunch of seals, for example, you can um, you can use you you basically are recording a two dimensional vector in latitude and longitude of where the animal was. And then you might have some external covariate like sea surface temperature or body temperature of the animal. Um, and from these, these tags and this high resolution uh, data that, that comes back, you can fit these hidden Markov models and try to separate out not just two, but maybe three or four behavioral states. And so you can theoretically tell whether the animal is diving or resting or, or just uh, you know, foraging, not traveling, um, and try to make inference. But, um, but these these types of so so that's one of the few cases where I've seen uh, three or four um, different states applied. I think I think there's fewer examples when you're just fitting a model to say time series of fisheries recruitment. But but these are definitely kind of up and coming models, and I think that we're going to see a lot more applications. Um, so before HMMs were 
were kind of uh, becoming popular. I think that there's there's a number of non hidden mark markup model approaches for detecting these regimes. One of these is is known as the stars algorithm, and so this is kind of a an approach to take a time series and chop it up, and then um, if you ever use like a moving window or running average type approach uh, for calculating calculating a mean or something or a variance. It's the same approach where you're, you're kind of sliding this, this thing through the, the time series and doing these t-tests to detect whether a change in the mean occurs. And if it is, then then you can uh, then you can um, identify a new regime. Um, there's also kind of the brute force model selection approach, and we've talked about this a little bit in this class. But the way to evaluate like a change point, if you were dealing with regression or uh, or like a time series or a REMA model, and you wanted to look at the data support for for a change in, in this the kind of underlying state, the way to do that would be to um, to create a new covariate, for example, and you could have the covariate be um, uh, like a zero before the change occurs and a one after, and that would that would basically introduce a new intercept term to the mean after the change occurs, and so you could basically slide through your time series, um, changing the value of that covariate, and then every time you fit it, you would store the AIC or whatever your favorite model selection uh, tool was and figure out across all of the different uh, data points basically in the time series where is your where is your AIC or your likelihood ratio uh, test statistic or whatever you're you know using to quantify performance where is that the, where is that the lowest or where is that the best and so that's that's kind of the brute force approach um, it's not as not as elegant as probably these HMNs um, so here we've got some simulated data that I generated, and you can um, you can see the code for doing this on the I think it's just on the um, on the slide on the markdown version of these slides. But uh, but basically I, I fitted a, or simulated a two regime model where we've got kind of these these two different two different levels um, that the model is flipping back and forth between, and then I've introduced some some error on top of it. So so like in this cooler regime here, or like in this lower regime here. All of these values are generated from the same mean, but I've just added, added uh, some normal error to, to basically scatter it. So, um, so given that data, I think that one one approach that you could take is we've used Mars or the Mars type package to fit this simple univariate state space model to this to you know to, to data like this. And there's no reason why you couldn't fit to use Mars to fit something like this um, kind of straight off the shelf. And I think. For a lot of applications, it's probably totally fine. I think where where Mars is maybe a little bit limited is that if you wanted to, if you cared in your application about classifying each of these data points into being one of your regime A or regime B, or you cared a lot about um, kind of the tipping points, so what's going on uh, right when the regimes are changing from state from uh, say regime B to regime A. Um, if you care about questions like that, then I think the HMMs are probably a better approach. Um, and you can see that, that the Mars model is going to be giving you kind of a smooth estimate um, through these transitions, whereas the HMM will be much more of a discrete change from, from this state to this state. Yeah, exactly. So this is, this is assuming just a random walk. So this is just underlying. Um, so this is like a Mars model. With where the process model is a random walk, there's no AR term. Yeah, so it's very simple. Um, so, uh, so that that that's all well and good. I think what we don't get out of uh, the Mars model is is questions like what's the probability of transitioning between these different regimes, or um, you know, if we go think about the future, how long might we expect these regimes to last, and what and what's the frequency of these regimes going forward? Um, but there is a ton of applications out there to non-ecology or fisheries problems, including things like speech recognition or finance. I've talked about animal movement, uh, modeling a lot of environmental data like rainfall, where you have long periods of drought followed by um, intense intense rainstorms, et cetera. Um, OK, so that's kind of the overview. Um, the next little bit I wanted to just briefly talk about is just kind of a little bit of the theory. But um, but I think this is could be pretty into the weeds if we're just interested in more of the applications. So I'll try to try to kind of gloss over this. Um, and there's a lot more references that we can we can talk about for people that are interested in diving into it more. Um, so with with hidden markup models, we are again assuming this markup process where um, where uh, the markup process again is just that your state 
or what, what the value of the state at time t is just dependent upon where you were one time step before. It doesn't depend at all on future values of the data. Um, and time can be discrete or continuous. And so for the cases of the, the time series models that we've used so far for this class, they've all been, they've all been discrete time. There's certainly versions of these models, like um, these kind of Gaussian, or like the, these random walk models that are um, continuous time equivalents. And with, with HMMs too, there's also uh, continuous time movement models, for example, where people are fitting continuous time HMMs to these kinds of data. But for the ca case of this class, it's really, we're, we're, our focus is really on discrete time because that's uh, a little bit easier to deal with. Um, so what the, the key, one of the key differences between kind of our conventional state space models and these HMMs are, uh, are including this uh, transition matrix. And so um, we basically, so if you've ever used a you know, kind of a stage structured population model, you're familiar with what, why a transition matrix is important. Um, the notation here is just, um, you know, the probability that the state, um, that the state that we don't observe is x at time t plus one is in state j. Given that x is in state uh, i at time t uh, is just this uh, gamma i sub j. And so that's just the probability of transitioning, or that's the prob probability of transitioning from i to j uh, in the next time step. And then what we can do is, is for like a three state, if we have a three state system, we can summarize these probabilities into this matrix where we have nine different parameters. And so uh, with nine different parameters, we could estimate all of these. We could, um, we could know that some of them were certain values a priori, or we could even zero out a lot of them. And so I think in the case of this three by three example, you know, we have, we have the probability of, of staying put in state one, given that we're there, the probability of transitioning from one to two, and the probability of transitioning from one to three. Um, the other weird constraint about this, which is, is probably something that everybody is aware of, is that if we're in state one, um, the constraint with estimation in this case is that these, these three probabilities have to sum to one. Because we can't, if, if we're in state one, we only have three options, um, and those, those are kind of mutually exclusive. Um, okay. Um, from this, I guess we'll, we can skip that. Um, so there's, there's kind of two different flavors of these transition matrices, uh, what are called kind of homogenous or stationary transition matrices. And these are, these are cases where our, um, the elements of that transition matrix don't depend on time. So they're not time varying, they're constant. Um, we can include covariates that are time varying, and those covariates can affect, can affect the transition probabilities. Um, but the, the elements themselves aren't time varying. And then we have the second case are kind of these non-homogeneous um, cases. And so in this case, this is where we could model those transition probabilities themselves as these random walks, for example. So those, that, that introduces kind of an additional complexity. Um, for this class, we'll just, just deal with, in this lecture, just kind of the homogeneous case where we have uh, these things that are basically fixed for the time series. We maybe include covariates or, or not, um, but, but things are not uh, themselves autoregressive. So covariates then can enter hidden marker models in one of two ways. We can let them affect the mean. And so um, if your mean response is if you're modeling, say, rainfall, um, this could affect, uh, uh, you know, you could have this, you could oscillate between this period of drought versus uh, intense, uh, intense rains. Um, or you could, you could actually model the effects of these covariates on the transition matrix. And so um, the covariates could affect any one of those transition elements differently. Um, and what makes things complicated, as I said, is that the probabilities are constrained. So they're constrained to be between zero and one. And then they are, their, their summation across the, the rows has to sum to one. And if you've ever used like um, a Dirichlet distribution or dealt with this, this, um, this kind of case for compositional data before, um, you're probably aware that that there's a number of complicated transformations that you have to do to, to make the data, to link the data to the covariates. And so I think one of the more common ones that is this multivariate logit, logit or logistic regression, um, and that involves taking, taking the data and um, transforming it, doing the regression, and then transforming, uh, transforming back to get the, the effects. If you, and so I think, I think that one of the other confusing things just to keep in mind is that when you're, 
when you're using something like multivariate logistic regression, it's, some, it's somewhat similar to dealing with regression where you're dealing with a, if you're doing a regression and you have a factor variable that has several levels, um, you often have a case where one of those levels is kind of confounded with your global intercept, so you have to fix the effect of that to zero. And the same is true here, where if you have three cases, you generally have to pick kind of your, your base case and fix that, at, that effect at zero and estimate the, the covariate effects on all the others. What is the mean? Um, yeah, so the mean would be like, um, so the mean would be like mean rainfall. Um, so the, yeah, so I think like, what's the, what, so if you're dealing with a univariate HMM, what, what is mean rainfall? Um, and the covariate then would be, it could be like, uh, Julian Day, yeah, something like that. And then if it affected the transition matrix, um, then I think like you could you could you could have like um, I don't know what a good thing. What's the probability uh, the probability of switching between uh, kind of a dry spell and rain is is itself going to be time varying? Which again I, I guess again if you have kind of yeah I mean maybe day of the year is is useful as a covariate there too. I'm not sure. So you've got this transition matrix, and then what are you going to multiply by it? It. Right. Um, good question. So, what do you what do you multiply by the transition matrix? Um, so, this is a little bit different in that um, I guess I guess the way to, to think about it is like if you have a two state system. So, if we're transitioning between drought and rain, um, at every time step, we draw a, a draw instead of multiplying that transi transi transition matrix by something. We draw a random number from uh, basically you could use like the sample function in R. So you have sample, and then you you have a two element vector, and then the probabilities that you assign it are the probabilities associated with staying versus transitioning. So um, so so it's more of generating a random. So going yeah, every time you jump to the next time step, you draw a new a random number from this two element vector. So good question though. Um, Okay, so we talked about the trans 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 transition probabilities. Um, then we have to link them to our observable data, which are kind of, I'm going to denote with the Ys. Um, and so one of the other key things, I'll skip over most of this, but, um, but in kind of the HMM notation or jargon, uh, one of the things that we're maybe interested in getting at are what are called these emission probabilities. So, these things are how likely the states are at any particular time step. So thinking about, um, you know, at time uh, at time step 20, how likely was it? What's the probability that it was uh, going to be a rainy day versus a, a drought day, for example? Um, I think we can skip this. We can skip these. I guess, yeah, if you're interested in these, these algorithms and really want to dive into HMMs, I think that um, there's some good reading in those zucchini books, but I think I'll probably skip that for, um, for the purpose of, of what we're trying to get through today and then just talk more about, focus more on these applications. Um, uh, okay, so for, as a first example, I thought I did just pull, um, you know, going back to kind of this rainfall example, um, you know, this is some rainfall data from that I grabbed from Weather Underground just from this year. So it starts in the end of 2018 on November 1st, uh, which I, I think I, yeah, so November 1st is day one. And we have about three months worth of data here where the y-axis is just precipitation in inches. And this is daily, daily rainfall accumulation, I think at, at CPAC or something. Um, and so the, all the, the CSV file is in a is basically on the, the GitHub repo when you can access it, um, and we can see that we we had I, uh, you know a, a number of a number of storms, but also we had a lot of dry days in November and December uh, where we get we get periods of, of long zeros. And so I thought that I mean so one one approach would be to just um, to just model this rainfall directly and. That's that's totally fine. It's it's doable in kind of the HMM setting, um, but there's probably other ways to to think about modeling it too. I think one approach would be if you've ever used like a you know a delta glim type model where you have a you have a model you can basically create a, a linear model or a time series model for uh, for whether or not it rained, and then you could create a second model for 
given that it, given that it rained, how much did it did it rain on a given day? And so that's kind of um, so mashing those two together kind of gives you the delta glim estimates. Um, you could include the time series model and put like a like a Tweety distribution on here, which would be more flexible than a gamma because the Tweety lets you have long tails, but then it also includes the, the zero values. And so you could do something like that. But for the purposes of illustrating kind of the HMM approach, I thought that um, you know it would be probably pretty easy and straightforward to just take our take our rainfall data, um, kind of reclassify it by creating a new variable, just this indicator of whether or not it rained, so it's zero and one. And then we'll fit the HMM to that. And so we've, we've taken our rainfall data from the last slide and then just transformed it to this zero or one um, or rain or not uh, example. OK, so questions that we could, we could pull out of this are um, things like condi conditional probabilities, which are just questions like, what, you know, given that it rains uh, today, what's the probability it rains tomorrow, or, or vice versa, or questions about persistence. And so, um, thinking about you know going forward, um, you know if, if it's not raining now, how how long is that drought likely to continue in the future? And so these are all questions that we can get out really easily with with um, taking those transition matrix elements that we estimate and then just um, you know calculating some simple summaries based on them. Um, so the caveat: we don't you know given this given this example, we don't probably really need H HMMs to to actually address these questions because. If you think about rainfall data, it's there. You know, there's hundreds of stations all over Seattle. It's measured. Every station has very little error, and so, um, so you could assume that there's basically no error and just calculate these things directly. But, um, but for the purposes of this this example application, we're going to assume that there's a tiny bit of error associated with with those uh, those values. That's what happened. Oops, sorry. Um, okay, let's skip that too. Okay, so. So, so to use the HMMs for this data, there's this package called uh, Debtmix S4, and it uses it's the S4 is just um, if you've never used a S4 object in R, there's a there's kind of these S3 or S4 classes, and so this one uses S4 uh, S4 uh, classes, which are a little tricky to manipulate to manipulate, but um, uh, are good for big data, and so. There's a good vignette here too that um, that's on CRAN that has a bunch of good examples to refer back to, um, and so that's what we'll use to kind of fit this fit this data. So, um, so to set it up, the basically using this package, there's kind of these two different functions that we need to work with. The first one is just called uh, called debtmix, and so we set this up using a formula that is um, probably I mean it should be familiar if you use LM or GLM. So our variable, this, this categorical zero or one variable reigned is just going to be um, a function of an intercept, which is what the tilde, tilde then one represents. Um, then we, so that's that was uh, whether or not it rained. Um, n states here represents the number of kind of alternative states, and so this is something that we have to specify a priori. So in this case, we, we think that there's there's two states, obviously, because it's a zero one variable. Um, the transition represents the a formula for the transition probabilities. In this case, um, we uh, we're going to assume that they are constant through time, and they're they're not affected by a covariate. So there's just that intercept. Um, and then we have to specify the family, which in this case we have a zero one categor categorical thing. So that's going to be binomial. And then our data frame is is going to be this rain. Um, if you haven't done a lot with the family arguments before in like a GLM setting, I think there's you can see a, a huge list of everything that's available just by querying the GLM response function. Um, but but basically everything that's in uh, GLM is available here. So you could do a Poisson or a gamma or or basically anything you want. Okay. So then uh, then once we've set the model up with that debt mix function, uh, it's usually a good idea to kind of set your Set your random number seed to something, and then fit the model using this fit function. And so, um, so I've done that here, and then we can look at the output with just a summary. Um, and we see here, I'm going to make this a little bit smaller again, so we can see the whole screen. Um, this is good enough. Um, so the tra transition matrix here represents the probability of transitioning from 
state one to state one is 0 0.77, and from uh, from two to two is 0.59. So those are basically the probabilities of not transitioning uh, from rain or or not rainy day. Um, so that's that looks totally fine. But just as a as a word of caution, that's that, uh, that these estimates can change a lot depending on what we set our seed at. So in this case, um, so just remember that this is like 0.77 and 0.59. Um, and I'll change the seed to point to to one to one, and these values are basically these values are basically switched, and that's that's totally fine. Uh, what that means is that the model is now thinking that state what 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 it was calling state one is now state two, and vice versa. So that's fine, but you can see and I'll, uh, you can see that once you start playing with the seed and, and exploring more values, these numbers start to um, start to really change a lot, and so you get a lot of different answers depending on where you start, which is, is pretty uh, pretty problematic and troubling um, if you can't get consistent answers by, uh, by, by trying a bunch of different, by, by using different seeds, you should converge at the same value. So, um, so there's a couple of, of practical ways, I think, to kind of uh, deal with this problem. The first is like what we've done with, with kind of the Mars package. There's, um, there's some settings and control parameters to tweak, to basically crank up your maximum iterations or really crank down your tolerance so that you're, you're, um, you're, more, li you're, you're more likely to, to assure that things have converged. Um, and unfortunately for this application, um, you, you can try these, try playing with these numbers using the Demix package, or in the Demix function call, but this doesn't actually change any of the, the issues. And the reason for this is that the likelihood is, is pretty flat in a lot of the region, and so, with a flat likelihood, um, the model is basically getting stuck uh, over and over and over. So a second way to do that is to, to just kind of run this estimation across a, a, a large number of different starting values. And so this is probably um, a, probably a pretty clunky way to do it, but and there's probably a, um, you know a more a more elegant way. But uh, but basically what we could do here is kind of iterate through this loop, and this is just some pseudo code, but iterate through this loop like a hundred times. And we'll just iteratively refit the model every time, and uh, we'll check after each each model is fit. We just check to see if, um, you know, say like the AIC value is better than the best that we've ever seen. If it is, we'll save that model and the the AIC value and just kind of repeat. Um, you don't have to use AIC here. You could just use basically any of your favorite model selection tools. But the idea here here is just like that we would we would. Um, Explore a large number of different starting values and ideally find the best model across all of those different values. Um, all right, so moving on to kind of example number two. This example is um, coming from um, kind of another ichthyoplankton data set that, um, that I've been working on a little bit with Mary Hunziker and some, um, some colleagues in California. And this is data from uh, the Cal Coffee Ichthyoplankton Cruise, uh, which has been going on since the late 1950s. Um, there have been a number of indicator species that have been used to identify kind of these cool versus warm regimes. And so you can think that uh, a lot of the classic examples are things like um, there have been some pretty, pretty huge fluctuations in numbers of anchovy and sardine um, that have been documented with Cal Coffee data. Um, for this example, I just grabbed data on a fish that's the California smooth tongue. And this is one of the species that's been used to kind of identify those cool and warm periods. And so um, this, this is a simplistic uh, kind of calculation of catch per unit effort for this, uh, for this species. Um, it's important to note that if you, did the, if you were to use this for, for real, for a paper or something, um, the data set itself is spatially gridded and the survey effort is kind of changing around in space. And on top of that, we have different species that are shifting their Nearshore and and uh, offshore dis distribution uh, and and latitudinal distribution based on whether the the year is a warm versus cool year. So, um, so what I've done here is just taken the mean catch per unit effort across all these stations for the kind of the spring period, which is April to May, and uh, it looks like this. You have some years where the species is basically not showing up at all, but then you have some other exploding years where the, where you have uh, you know really high abundance. Okay, so 
taking this model um, and using the debt mix package again. So uh, what I've done here is just kind of log transform the data so that I can assume that everything is normally distributed. Um, the default family in debt mix is Gaussian, so I don't have to specify that. Um, the number of states again is just going to be two, and then we can fit the model again uh, very easily. Um, and then I think it's important, there, so there's two different kinds of predictions that we can get out of this fitted object. The first are, um, well, I guess that the both of them are sound very similar, but they're slightly different. Uh, the first are these state probabilities, and so um, uh, there's two ways to, to present this. We can get the most probable state trajectory, which is kind of across all of, you can think about um, from the starting point in the time series to the ending point in the time series. There's a number of ways to walk through that um, in terms of these discrete states. And so thinking about um, the simpler, I guess like thinking about the rainfall example, um, there's uh, basically an infinite number of combinations of, of classifying days as being a drought day versus a rainy day. And so you can think about, if you, if you think about all of the different combinations or ways you could do that across that time series, which one of those, which one of those um, is most probable. So, um, so it's the entire state that you care about there. And so that's the, when I say the most probable state trajectory, that's, that's what I'm talking about. It's, it's thinking about drawing all of those paths through the, through the latent data and then picking the one that's, that's most likely. The second way to think about it is what are called, called the marginals or the posteriors of the, um, of the latent states. And so that is more not thinking about the whole path, but picking a given day and saying, uh, you know, on day 20, what's the probability that it rained or what's the probability that it was a drought? So, um, so you can get each of these out of, out of the, uh, the fitted object. I think that the, the latter, the marginals, are probably more useful for a lot of the applications that I work on. But, but if you do care about the, the path, um, uh, it's definitely available. Okay. So um, the most probable states here are, you know, we can just get them out by passing our uh, the fitted object into this posterior function, and then we can we can plot the states very easily. So this is kind of what the, the states look like. Um, and then, oops. Um, and then we can also get out the, the coefficients. And so given, given, in addition to those transition probabilities or the, the states, um, you know, DEPMIX will estimate the means or the levels associated with each of these different regimes. So, um, so it's essentially what's the mean cash per unit effort in state two and what's the mean cash per unit effort in state one. And so this is kind of what the, what the predictions look like from everything combined. Um, things look, things look okay. I think there's, there's definitely cases, like you can definitely see that the model is picking up, uh, with, when cash per unit effort is really low, the model is definitely classifying those years as being really low years. Some problems in that, um, you know, especially if we look at the end of the time series, where we have uh, kind of this process that's more of like a gradual trend, um, the, you know, the HMM cannot pick up that trend because it's just, it's just classifying things by moving the mean around. So I think um, this is the case where you probably want to use a covariate or, um, or you know, explore a little bit more complicated model. Yeah. If you have a covariate, maybe like equivalent to one long time series to have like five really short ones or something? Um, what, do you, what do you mean? Like, um, I don't know, because I'm trying to figure out if it's like the same thing if you have like 10 just like single transition observations, yeah. or is it like one really long series that has like 10 transitions? Oh, percent, yeah, like I guess. Um, like clearly they'd be experiencing the same thing if you had like five, five year time series from like 1980 to 1985. Yeah. In terms of like the actual estimation itself, it's the same. Yeah, it would be it would be the same. I think where you would get uh, where you, your 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 answers would change if you started trying to fit an HMM with two states to um, shorter chunks of data where that where you didn't see both like like for a lot of this this early time series you see both the low and the high regimes. But if there if you wanted to fit the data in like the two state model to this chunk, which doesn't really show that lower regime. Um, it's still going to try to classify some of these points as being state one with like the, the low regime, 
So it wouldn't do a very good job there. Um, and when you mash everything, if you try to mash everything together, you would get kind of some, some weird inference from this period versus the others. And then what happens if data is irregularly spaced too? Let's say I miss a year. That's totally fine. Yeah, so missing data is totally fine. Um, um, because because it doesn't, yeah, as long as as long as you have missing data, that's fine. Um, so it would have to be like a 10-8, right? So yeah, right, right there. exactly, yeah. And then one more question. Mm -hmm. What happens if you, so how do you determine the number of spaces? I'm sure, for you always? That's that's a great question. Um, so I do. I mean, in an ideal world, you you would put together a model and um, treat that as a parameter, but that that is really hard to do. There's there's um, it's kind of like a mixture problem. And there's a there's a famous paper. Um, I forget. Uh, I think it was. It could have been by one of Brad Carlin's papers, but it was. It's called this galaxy problem. Um, trying to identify like I think it's an astronomy data. Is that trying to identify the number of galaxies that are underlying this mixture, and so I think um, uh, in that in that case, if you, you have a small number of uh, kind of things that you're combining, or a small number of states in this case, you could include that as a parameter for really simple models. But I think for these more complicated cases, you have to do more of a model comparison, and so I think um, that's definitely possible. Um, and that's I mean that's kind of what what I've tried to do here, and that like I think. If you do have a case going back to this, this example where you know the model is doing an okay job for most of it, but there's still like like some weird behavior, um, if you don't have a covariate, the next step would be to try to maybe think about adding a state and seeing how that changed things. And so, uh, so for this case, um, you know, I calculated AIC from the two-state model is like 119, and for the three-state model, it it doesn't really do any better, and so that's not going to solve the problem. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean for this. This application, we would have covariates, but I think if we didn't, um, maybe we could uh, truncate the time series and you know just pretend like we didn't calculate, didn't see that data ever. Or um, yeah, it's, 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 I, don't, I don't have a really good solution, but that's that's a, that's a great great question though. Um, so the other cool thing, yeah, about these HMMs is that we can include multiple time series, and so I think. I think that it's good to kind of contrast this with DFA because everybody's everybody's now familiar with DFA. Um, you know, DFA is this dimension reduction tool where we feed in a number of different time series, um, and then DFA uh, tries to re reduce the dimensionality by you know picking say uh, two underlying trends, and we estimate the loadings of each of those time series onto those trends. Um, the HMM is similar in that we're trying to Basically, model the underlying process, but we don't estimate the loadings, and so we estimate the single kind of state that's discrete. Um, but we don't we aren't estimating loadings on each of the different time series to that underlying uh, trend. And so I think um, there have been I think that Mark has thought about this a little a little bit um, that you could basically create a DFA that had um, that had a Markov this hidden Markov model as a discrete state that, that underlied it, but um, but that really isn't isn't what's going on here. Um, so uh, so basically, yeah. So we can include multiple time series. They can have missing values. They can have different lengths or different error dis distributions. So you can mix categorical and continuous data, which is I guess is something you can't do with um, with the DFA. Um, and then using the debt mix package, um, each of these arguments that we were dealing with before just becomes a list. And so just to show quickly how to do that. Um, I just added another of the Kalkaki species to this data. So again, these two things are really correlated. And the function call here just changes our wait, uh, this is just reshaping the data, which we don't need to show. Um, the function call just changes slightly in that we now are passing a list of formulas where every species gets its own formula. Um, again, the number of states is just two. And then the family is just going to be a list of uh, two Gaussian distributions, but um, but that's just because I had log transformed the catch per unit effort. You could do a Gaussian and a binomial, or you know whatever else kind of data you had could be could be in there. Um, so it's pretty flexible. Um, they are, yeah. So just like these, uh, just to summarize quickly, um, you know most of the estimation here is done in the maximum likelihood setting. I think that we talked last week that some people in the class had, had used JAGs before or WinBugs, and and JAGs and WinBugs are um, you know, really good tools 
especially because, I mean, one of the, one of the advantages is that they have this categorical sampler. And so if you want to do a Bayesian version of a HMM, uh, something like JAGS is really useful um, because it has that sampler built in and a lot of other languages don't. Um, a downside in the maximum likelihood world is just like we can easily get stuck in these kind of false positive um, um, or false uh, false maximum likelihood estimates. Um, and finally, I guess I guess talk about JAGs and bugs. But um, you know, I think that there are a few applications of these these types of models in things like STAN or TMB. But uh, but they generally are uh, are like two state uh, two state models. Um, anything more than that starts to get really complicated because STAN and TMB rely on uh, kind of the gradient of the parameters with respect to the likelihood. And so because of that, um, you know, this is not something that's really doable in, in kind of these, uh, these newer languages. So, um, so yeah, if you want to do something like this for a class project, um, certainly come talk to, to one of us. But I think we're not going to do a lab on this. And so this is kind of the only, only you know, uh, HMM stuff that I think you'll see for the next, the next few weeks. Um, okay, with that I'm going to stop sharing the screen here and um, see if there's, does anybody have any questions on HMMs before we transition to kind of the lab stuff? Yeah, I have a sure, yeah, fire away. Um, so with the multivariate HMMs, is that like one transition matrix for both of the time series? So basically it's same underlying state for both of them. Exactly, yeah. So 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 you estimate a single transition matrix for all the time series. Yeah. Okay, so it's like one one. Yep. Like, do people ever like use this as a baseline to say like, okay, probability it's in state one versus state two and then add something on to like determine what the catch would be on top of that? Like given it's in state one, you can predict catches in state two based on some covariance or something. Yeah, um, yeah, you could definitely do that. Um, uh, but yeah, because you get the probabilities out of each state. Um, I haven't seen forecasting with that kind of catch data yet, but I'm sure that eventually, yeah, I'm sure it's 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 a matter of time before somebody does 